Our next speaker is uh, Jenny Isler from Penn State. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, my topic today is on sustainable dairy cropping systems, and we call this the virtual dairy farm, and you'll see that in a few minutes why it's called that. Um, I just want to um, recognize Heather Karsten, who's a professor at Penn State, who is leading this project, which was funded through um, Northeast SARE. Uh, Glennon Malcolm is the postdoc who handles the day-to-day -day activities of this project. And Tim Beck is a uh, farm management educator that we work with. And Jill was talking this morning about you wanted more economic information. So I'll be giving you some economics here. Um, this project um, is very interdisciplinary. And there must be 25 plus faculty and staff that are on this project. And that doesn't include all the graduate students. Um, so, so this is a huge project. And um, we're looking at developing sustainable dairy cropping systems and monitoring multiple indicators of systems performance. And I just have some pictures down here below that we're looking at uh, red clover as a green manure. We've got cover crops. We've got um, integrated pest management. We've got alfalfa. So there's a whole lot to this project that we're just touching the tip of the iceberg. Um, but what I'm presenting on today is that we're comparing two very diverse cropping approaches and what I'm looking at is the impact on feed inventory, feed quality, and economics. And so what I'm going to be presenting today is we're going to be comparing two scenarios. Um, so the one I'm going to be referring to is the best um, management practice, but then we also have a best management practice enhanced. So the best management and best management enhanced, they both have similar practices, which is cover and green manure crops. They both have alfalfa and alfalfa orchard grass mix, has integrated pest management. And one thing that's very novel for us in Pennsylvania is we're growing canola for both the feed and the fuel. Now in the enhanced um, practice, we're also incorporating small grains for silage. We are only growing alfalfa and an or orchard grass mix. In this particular scenario, we are using reduced herbicide, where in the other practice, we're using standard herbicide. And in the enhanced, we're using manure injection versus in the um, just the regular best management, we're doing um, surface or broadcast um, application of manure. And so that's how I'm going to be identifying the two practices here as we look at some of the comparisons. Uh, this is a picture of our agronomy farm at Penn State. And the goal is here to produce the forage feed and fuel for a 65 lactating cow. And I know probably out in this area that seems pretty small, but in Pennsylvania the average herd size is about 60, 65 cows. And this is on 240 acre, um, and we're trying to minimize off-farm inputs. So at, at the agronomy farm, we're growing these crops at 1 20th the size, but we're still using farm scale equipment. And so when we scale this up on our 240 acre farm, we have 100 acres that are committed to the alfalfa mixtures, we have 40 acres to corn silage, and then our grain co crops we have 20 um, for corn grains, soybeans, and wheat, which the wheat is we're using for the straw or the bedding component, and we have 40 acres that are in canola. And then we have cover crops which are rye and red clover. And so what we're taking from, from this is we're looking at the crop yields and we're looking at the quality. And I know in some of the sessions today, there's been, um, and yesterday, we're talking about models. Well, as Dan mentioned, one of my roles is managing the um, university dairy. And so not only do I use the model, but our dairy herd is getting fed a ration very similar to what we're doing here in the virtual farm. So what I'm doing here is that when the when the dairy herd goes up in production, our virtual farm probably does. When they go down because of temperature, heat stress, our virtual farm goes down. So I am using a real life herd to um, mimic what we're doing here for our virtual farm. So um, our dairy herd, here's what it looks like. And I want to emphasize this is a startup dairy. Um, this created some challenge when we're starting this project because if we were to assume we were an established farm, we would have to make a whole lot of assumptions about how much previous inventory we would have. And to me, that seemed like it was going to muddy the waters a lot. And in Pennsylvania, we do have farms that do start up this way, so this is not unrealistic. And this way, we're, we're starting with a clean slate. 
Um, so we have 65 milking cows, and they're averaging about 34 kilos. But we have the other animals on the farm that we have to take into account. So we have the dry cows, and we have all the heifers. And this herd officially started its rations on November 1st, um, 2010. And in this scenario, we are in a tie stall barn. And here's a picture for those of you that may not have seen what a tie stall, stall barn looks like. And in this farm, we do feed a total mixed ration to the lactating cows. And we have the dry cows and heifers, which get a partial TMR, which means that usually we have some additional forages that, it, that are fed outside of the TMR. And we have five upright silos. Now, when doing this from the economic standpoint, um, Tim Beck, the farm management, so we've taken into account that we've had to take out loans to, because um, we already had some of these facilities in place, but we had to upgrade them. So we actually have the um, financial part of it using FinPAC that takes into account that this farm has had to take out loans, there's capital purchases, or all of that. So we have a pretty complicated, intensive um, economic part that's taking into account um, what this farm would have to do if it was starting up. And we are taking into account that we are um, accounting for lo losses during storage and feed out. Um, our rations, which are similar to what we're feeding at the Penn State herd, we're feeding a 65% forage based ration, 35% concentrate, heavy forage rations for the dry cows and heifers, and we're using the models to formulate for metabolizable protein, which is what we're also doing at Penn State. So our, our protein in the ration is between 15 and 16% in the diet. So I'm gonna share with you some of the information now that we have three years worth of data. And so this is a summary inventory of the best management practice and the best management practice enhanced. And here for corn silage, um, 2010, we had very good yields. We had very good weather. Um, we averaged, I think it came to about 19 tons to the acre, which was very typical for our farms in Pennsylvania during that year. However, you can see what happened in 2011 and 2012. We're feeling the drought. We're feeling some of this weird weather that we've experienced in Pennsylvania. And that has started to reflect in what we've been getting in our inventory um, for 2011 and 2012. Then if we look at our hay crop forage, um, keep in mind that in 2010, primarily everything was a new seeding. So when we're looking at our alfalfa and our alfalfa grass mixtures, we had very low yields that first year because we were only probably getting either one or two cuttings off of it. Um, 2011, as far as moisture content, we did very well at getting um, multiple cuttings off of our alfalfa and alfalfa grass mixtures. However, in 2012, we had a very unusual spring. It got very warm. Yes? Yeah, can you tell me what the units are that you're talking about? We're talking about tons. Tons? Yes. Of dry or wet? No, this is wet. Sorry about that, I missed that. Um, yeah, we're talking as fed tons. Um, and you can see in our um, best management practice enhanced um, in 2012, we took a a big drop in, in inventory because of the type of weather that we had. So this had a, was very detrimental, and this was something that our farms in Pennsylvania dealt with. So what we had to do here, um, when I have a hay crop forage plus annuals, we had to do what a lot of producers had to do. We had to incorporate small grain, and we had to incorporate sorghum sudan. We had to look at alternative forages because from the farm standpoint of what I needed to feed the cows, we are gonna come up very short. And you can see that um, in here, in the enhanced, we had small grains, which boosted our inventory. And you can see how the additional, especially here in our enhanced, with um, moving that from 589 tons with the sorghum sedan boosted that up to 983 tons. This is part of the story that we're trying to get to our producers, that you've got to be flexible, you've got to be able to you know, know what you're feeding and make decisions to sort of um, compensate for some of the, the weather issues that we're dealing with, which goes with the climate change that we were talking about yesterday, is this is a real effect that we're dealing with. And then the next is to look at the quality of some of the um, uh, ingredients that we're harvesting and and I'm sharing here um, some of the challenges that we had early on with the canola and the soybeans um, 
under the canola meal, the typical is what we would be for the solvent extracted, 40.8% um, protein, 4% fat. But what, when we're harvesting the canola, we're doing mechanical extraction. And if you look at 2010, we had very low protein and we had a very high fat content in the canola. And what we found out is that the moisture content was too high and we didn't do a good job of extracting the oil out. Um, then in 2011 and 2012, uh, we did a much better job and we seem to be staying around at this 11, 12% fat. Ideally from a nutritionist, I'd like to see if we could get that lower, but we do seem to um, be doing a little bit better. With our soybeans, um, this is typical for us in, in the box, 41.8% protein, 18% fat. Um, the first year in 2010, we found out that we were short on potash. And so that had a uh, negative effect on the protein and also on the fat content. So that was corrected. And you can see now in 2011 and 2012, um, our analysis is looking very um, close to what we would typically expect for soybeans. If you look at our corn silage analyses, and um, I just picked this out because most of us um, work with corn silage, but for any of the forages, um, we have not seen any differences between um, the strategies, between um, the broadcast manure, which is the best management practice, and the ejected manure, which is the enhanced. And these analyses are very typical of what we see at Penn State for the corn silage that's harvested for the university herd. So what the monthly events are that, that I'm responsible for is that I need to formulate the diets for all the animal groups. And so each month I'm tracking the inventory um, that we're feeding out for the various animal groups. I calculate the grain mix costs and I track income overfeed costs. And so let me just um, get you familiar with this um, graph a little bit. So income over feed cost is taking the milk income, which is calculated from the milk price and what the average milk production is, and we're subtracting off the feed cost. And this is on a per cow per day basis. And so when you look at the um, far axis here, the, the numbers, so when you see here in 2011, we got to a high of $12. That means that's $12 income over feed cost after we paid all the feed expenses for the lactating cows. So that's how much money is left over to pay all the other expenses on the farm. And if any of you have been familiar with the dairy industry, you know that 2012 was not a very good year. And that's reflected in the income over feed cost. And, and this is something that we're trying to look at and track and see how do these different cropping strategies, um, how, do, how do we weather the storm during these low times. So we have the blue, which is the enhanced best management practice in the red is just the, the um, standard best management practices. But we have seen here during two times that the enhanced practices has shown a slight advantage in income over feed cost. And the reason for this is one, forage quality. We had um, weather challenges with the alfalfa grass silage quality in the best management practice enhanced scenario and I had to feed between 40 to 43 percent concentrate and heavier corn silage in 2011. Now you're probably thinking, well that doesn't make sense, you're feeding more concentrate, you'd think that that would be more expensive. However, we're, we're growing our own corn, we're growing our own soybeans, and we're growing our own canola meal. And when you take in the price of what we're raising on farm and putting in here, it actually was economically a little bit more advantageous than um, the regular BMP strategy. The other um, scenario that came through was the effect of forage inventory. We had no carryover of corn silage for the regular BMP scenario for fall of 2012, and we had to feed fresh corn silage. And those of us that deal with nutrition know that when you have to feed fresh corn silage, you have a negative impact on milk production. So we saw a negative effect on milk production However, in our in enhanced scenario, we had a two-month carryover of corn silage, so we were able to maintain or increase milk production. So we're seeing how the inventory and quality are impacting um, sort of the economics of these different farm scenarios. Okay, this is giving you um, a little bit, and this may be more economics than what you want to be um, digesting right now. 
So we're looking at the cost prices for crops grown in 2010 on, on the BMP scenario and on the enhanced. So if you look over here in the far left, every month I do a feed price list. And so these are, this is the average market price dollar per ton for 2011. So for example, corn silage for that year averaged $33 a ton. And then you can see what it actually cost us to produce the forages in the different scenarios, which we were pretty close. This is not a good thing. Um, we should be a lot lower, but um, you're seeing that our costs are pretty close to what the market price is. Where you really see the impact during our first years in the alfalfa grass silage and the alfalfa hay, because they were new seedings, we had very limited cuttings, so the inputs are staying the same whether you had two cuttings or four to five cuttings. So that's why you're seeing very high prices for our um, alfalfa um, silage mixes, whether it's silage or as hay. But you can see what we did here on our corn, soy, um, what it cost us to produce it was much lower than what it would be if you had to pay for it um, based on the market. And because this is the first time doing the canola, you can see that our unit prices um, were pretty high, but we should know that this includes um, the canola that takes into account not only the meal, but also the oil. So that's why we have, it's a little bit higher than what you would have seen on the market. The good news is now for the crops grown in 2011, but were fed in 2012, here you can see the difference in the market prices for the various forages. However, again, looking at corn silage, our cost to produce the corn silage was a little bit less than market, but we, now we've had a substantial impact on our hay crop forages. What has cost us to raise it is much lower than the market price. And again, this is because we got four to five cuttings off of those crops, and we're still doing a very good job as far as what's it costing us to produce the corn and the soybean and our price of the canola meal has come down. So the question that, that people have been asking is how does the virtual dairy startup farm, and I have to emphasize startup, compared to established Pennsylvania dairy operations? And one of the things is we work with Pennsylvania um, dairy producers in doing their cash flow plans. So we, we have this information and so we're looking at the summary data of the farms that we've worked with. And in 2011, the purchase fee cost per cow was about uh, $1,200, $1,300, compared to our um, different scenarios, which are about half of that. So our purchase fee cost on our scenarios are, are very, very low. And you can see in 2012, when feed prices were high, we were up to almost $1,500 per cow. But yet in our two scenarios, we're still maintaining about half of the purchased feed cost. Now when you look at the break-even income over feed cost, and this is after we're doing a complete, complete cash flow, so we're taking into the, the whole fixed cost, operating expenses, everything. Our farms in Pennsylvania are having break-even income over feed costs around $7.50 up to $7.76 for 2011 and 2012. You can see for our two scenarios, we're up around $10. This is not very good. If this was an established farm, they would be in a lot of trouble. For a startup farm, this is not unrealistic. The good news is that from 2011 to 2012, we've come down. So we're moving in the right direction. And we're looking at our BMP enhanced is actually showing a slight advantage. And now we're getting into a, an area that we're becoming a little bit more competitive. And I would say as we start doing this project over multiple years, we, we will be more of an established farm and not so much a startup farm. So now going back to the graph that I showed you earlier on income over feed cost, this is based off of using market prices for home raised feeds. The reason why we do that is because the farms that we work with, a lot of them do not know what it costs them to produce feed. So this way we can compare apples to apples when we're comparing farms. But now I've given you what the break even numbers are for our farms. The blue is the BMP enhanced, the red is our just our general best management practices. But you can see on the dotted line where our break even is. So when we're above our break even, we're making money. 
When we're below the break even, we're losing money. So we're trying to say is that we want to, now here in 2012, a lot of producers were not making any money, they were losing it, but we want to make getting this break even number, we want to keep getting that down so that there's more times than we're making um, profit. However, when you look at the cost, so this is taking into the cost to produce our feeds. How did we do on our break even? So this is showing the dollars above or below break even. We were above our break even. So even though our break even number was $10, we were still the first year, 2011, we're making 42 cents on average per cow. Um, and our hams, $1.51. In 2012, for the regular BMP, $1.72. In the enhanced two dollars and eighteen. So it looks like right now that our enhanced best management practice is showing a slight advantage in what we're making um, per cow. So in conclusion, um, the value of this project is evaluating the sustainability of the practices over time. And I think over time is what we really need to emphasize because now we're starting to, to see the weather effects, how the inventory and the quality is impacting um, the enterprise. In our economic analysis, we're doing both the whole farm system as well as the dairy enterprise. In the one scenario, we may have more additional feed that we can sell, which is going to be a positive for the um, enterprise. But we also want to see, is the dairy able to be sustainable on its own without generating additional income? Um, generating the canola meal and the straight vegetable oil as a fuel source is a novel concept. And this project can be scaled down to evaluate herds that have a limited land base. Um, the way that this um, project is set up, we can go in and change numbers. So if we, if we had a 65 cow lactating herd on only 150 acres, we can put that in there and see what the impact of our different cropping strategies would have on that. Um, in the proceedings, um, you have links to the detailed information about this project. Um, one of the things that's been very popular with the producers is the impact of slugs. Um, slugs are a major pest for us and have had, I think, the slugs um, and, and some of the insects that have affected our crops, that's been one of the challenges here in, in these different cropping strategies. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot more going on than what I presented um, here. So if you wanted to get more information about the project, that's where you can find it. Thank you.